So Wilson Winneray, former All Black captain, went from rugby to a Harvard MBA and a career in business which took him to the boards of some of the country's greatest companies. It should come as no surprise this is a businessman who focuses on character, confidence and competitiveness. So Wilson, describe your leadership style. Well of course there's many different leadership styles and you'll discover this as you talk to other people. And uh, I don't know that we... Uh, consciously set about having a style, it's what emerges from our experiences uh, and, and tasks along the way. So as I reflect on what I think my leadership style was, it's probably that I was fairly collegiate, collegial, um, communicative, uh, embracing of the people around me, um, and fairly open. But in the end, uh, it always falls pretty much to one person to make the decision. I, I don't think, I don't suggest for a minute my style was one of uh, committee deciding on uh, what was going to happen or majority votes. It, was, it would come back to, for serious matters, one person has to make the decision and uh, then set about implementing it. Does that mean you make hard calls that sometimes go against what other people advise? Yes, but uh, if you were with a group where the majority feeling or, or substantial number of those with a different view were not happy with it, you'd have to consider it very deeply because, you see, we must realise uh, always that we're not always right. It's nice to think that we'd be always right, but sometimes, and I'm sure that most people have gone to a meeting uh, where a topic's to be discussed and you've had the information and you get a position that you think you're pretty solid on, but as the discussion flows and you're hearing other people's views, you change direction a bit quite frequently. And you might not change totally, but you'll modify your position and probably, hopefully, end up improving it. So um, I would prefer to get a real degree of consensus around the table. Uh, and if you've got key people that are totally opposed to what you're doing, then you really have a problem. Uh, because their input is going to be important, because nearly all the people around the table considering an important decision are going to have specific ta tasks to play in it. There'll be marketing people or production people or technical people or financial people, and if one or two of those core areas were totally opposed to what you're doing, you'd want to take a dig deep breath and explore and tease out why they were. What do you then consider your single most important skill? I suspect that uh, that would probably be a, 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 a good load of experience late in my career because that's something that builds up over time. Uh, early on I think a general level of common sense and judgement uh, and I've always had reasonable um, relationships with people um, that seem to fit comfortably with me and I, and I with them. So it was a combination, I guess, of people skills, common sense and eventually experience. And the common sense bit flows, I think, from in part from uh, what you learn along the way, and in part from a very good education that I had in a formal sense. Of course, you went on to Harvard. I did an MBA at Harvard Business School and a BCom here in Auckland. Do people need to get a business qualification? No, I don't think so. I, I think if, if, if that's what they want to do, do it, but don't feel they've got to do it to reach point B. Uh, I think it is helpful for most people to have a, uh, a tertiary qualification. Um, I think it's helpful. Yes, certainly people can point to many, many people who have done extraordinarily well um, without much formal education at all, and that's, that's good, that's as it should be. But when you're look, talking of percentages and numbers of people, you'll find there'll be one in a thousand or something, whereas young men and women who go off and do a tertiary education uh, uh, in terms of having a good successful working life and uh, doing well as we say 
you would find that it might be uh, 60 or 70 per cent of them do. So the numbers favour um, doing some formal education, I think. So let's dig deeper. What personally drove you to success? I think I've always been uh, somewhat competitive by nature. And what, uh, what interests me with any job I've been given is to try and do it well. And uh, it's very embarrassing to be given a task and fail at it or mess it up. So it's not a matter of a financial reward type thing other than the pleasure of feeling you've done something well. And of course, once you start doing that, you develop a confidence uh, that almost in the back of your mind, um, there's the little voice saying, well, give me a tough job and I'll handle it. You don't run away from the jobs. You, you, and I can remember one of my, about my last day at business school and uh, the uh, professor there wasn't many years older than I was because I was in my early 30s when I went. And he said, well, I'll give you some advice fellows and girls, get a job when you leave here where you can be measured, where you can be measured. Uh, if you're in sales or marketing, where there's sales or marketing results, quarterly or annually or semi-annually. Production uh, me measured on output or wastage or goods per hour, goods per unit of energy used and so on and so on. Financial measures as well. And he said, then you can build up a feeling of successes, that you've done something tough and you've done it well. But he said, uh, and, and he said, then you can carry on and build on that. And I didn't understand what he was saying at the time, I don't think, but I certainly do now. And um, so uh, my motivation always was trying to do things well. And it was the same in sport, too, I might tell you. Where did that competitive streak come from? Oh, I think people are, or some are. You, you've, all of us remember kids in the class at school that were always sort of uh, in the front of the queue or uh, front of the tuck shop line, or, uh, first one out with the ball or whatever. So I, I think you're a bit born that way, but you can, you can change as you go along. To be successful in business, do you need to have that inner confidence? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, but, but, again, uh, that doesn't mean you've got the, the level of confidence at, at 24 or 5 or 6. Because we haven't. You haven't, you haven't faced the challenges then. Um, they, they just drift in along as the decades go by. There. And, and as you go up, you're getting tougher and tougher jobs to do, uh, more demanding and more miserable, usually. So the confidence thing, uh, without it... Uh, I think I think one of the most wonderful things that we can uh, develop in our children and uh, others is, is confidence that they can handle uh, what comes up, and uh, and that part of that's education, part of it's just doing things well, part of it's succeeding in something. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a sporting thing, a long jump, or a netball game. It can be some art or some music, playing a piano, doing some dance. Uh, growing a decent garden or whatever. I mean, that you just got to do something well and say, well, I, that's, I can do things well. And in business, confidence is a great thing. And of course, the opposite's true too. When you lose confidence, it takes a bit of getting back on track. Let's move then from your own sense of self-confidence as a leader to how you instill confidence in and get the best out of those you lead. The, um, I think you've got to hopefully you get a respect both ways you you can't demand respect as a as the leader as the boss but hopefully you you earn their respect and they uh, trust you and uh, rely on you for that sort of uh, uh, things might be a bit confusing but all is well we're, we're in control we're tidy uh, and I think the trust and respect has to go the other way too you've got to feel you've got good people around you uh, one of the most important things you can do, of course, is, is to attract good people around you and keep them there. Most successful leaders that uh, you read about are ones that have the ability to attract and retain good people. And uh, that's just not a financial reward thing. It's, it's a feeling that they're important, and, and they've got to feel it. They, they've got to feel they're important. You give them the responsibility to do jobs. They, uh, they understand exactly what the task is. 
give them the uh, um, authority, the, the, the staff, some of them maybe even extra training somewhere. And I'm not suggesting going back to a small university course, but you might do something on well, a short course somewhere at Harvard or in, in Europe. There's all, there are all sorts of things. And um, so let them know exactly what's expected of them um, and uh, give them what they need and uh, reward them. And then uh, I always think, uh, you know, you get into this pra praise and uh, criticism type area. And I think uh, praise should be modest. It doesn't have to be fulsome, just modest. And that's in public. Amongst, you know, you've done a great job on this, uh, David. Or, you know, uh, criticism should be private, I think. You just deal with it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, so, I, I, but it's a very, very people thing, uh, keeping and training good staff. I want to move on to mistakes. How have you coped with mistakes? Yes, well, uh, I've never found in life that making mistakes was a very wise path to follow. <laughs> but like Frank Sinatra says in his song, uh, you know, mistakes, so I've made a few, uh, and then a few too few you know, to mention. And, um, and of course, if you're making decisions, you're going to make mistakes. But the important things about mistakes is, is if you're going to make them, Try and make little ones. <laughs> Avoid making big mistakes because that's painful, especially if you're in a listed company. Um, you, know, you get onto this whole area of risk. Uh, uh, some people don't know the difference, I think, between being risk, uh, risk aware and risk averse. And risk averse sort of says don't take on any risk at all. Risk aware is be very aware of what risk you're taking on and the what ifs. What if this doesn't work? What if we only get half the sales we think we're going to get by putting that new plant in costing two, $200 million? Um, what if, what if? So at least you understand the risk you're taking. And then the third comment on that is basically that you can do what you like with your own money. If you want to put it all on the nose of a racehorse, you're free to do it. But when you're risking other people's money, uh, and we could say small shareholders particularly, but then many of the institutions, big shareholders, are really made up of bundles of small shareholders with super funds. In. So I think you've got to be very careful when you're risking other people's money. So where do I come out on it? I, I, I think you've just got to take on calculated risk from time to time, but it, it's always got to be that if it goes pear-shaped, uh, you're not damaged too much at all. You can pick it up in a year or two. Now, uh, making mistakes, I think um, I, I've never made big mistakes, I don't think, thank goodness. Um, some of them begin to do with people, that if you're not careful, you can select people for senior jobs, maybe reporting, you know, head of finance or head of sales, marketing or technology, that have done well in fairly easy jobs or easy markets where they might be, there's one sort of area I know which I won't detail, but where, where they had a monopoly and they could make great money year after year after year. And that was almost a golden path to promotion if you went through that company because you... And those fellows sometimes would get picked ahead of someone who was in a tough, tough industry with several competitors and several competitors are more or less equally strong, so if you get into a price-cutting situation or a buying of uh, raw materials at better or worse prices, it was very difficult. Sometimes you pick the guy that's done well in a soft situation ahead of the one who's grafted tough in a tough situation. I remember an all-black selector who I respected very much, and he said, the biggest mistakes I've made have been selecting players who play well against poor teams at the expense of fellas who tough it out against good teams. And, and so you get my point on that. It's, it's almost simpler explaining it in a rugby situation you know, or a sports situation. If there was one thing you've learnt over your career that you would never find in a textbook, what is it? There is a... Um, the one lesson is in the end, or 
at the start, it all comes back to you. You, you, you know, the old, uh, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. And you, you can go to, you, you, you go to a business school or find a leadership textbook or do this and then you can almost feel you can tick boxes. I'm very good at communicating, see, I've written all these beautiful memes. And I can explain things well, and I make good presentations, and I'm uh, very good at uh, people skills because we go and have a beer on a Friday night and we chat away, and, uh, and uh, I'm quite good at my basic uh, core discipline and so on. But it, it's it's um, so therefore, why aren't I leading the show? And they might not just have that push and drive that uh, that gets them underway. You see, I don't, I don't. You get into this debate at times of uh, are leaders made or born. And there is no answer to that, because there is no answer to it. Uh, but I do think um, some people are born, and it may be the environment they grow up in, it may be a family thing, it may, it may be, I don't know, that they just have a little bit more of a push to get on. And then and they start getting on, they start getting on this confidence treadmill. And um, uh, so... Uh, I, I think you, it does come back to you, and along the way, uh, things obviously in life things don't always go as you would want them to, and you get knocked over, and uh, you can either stay knocked over or get up and dust yourself down and start again, or benefit from the mistakes that we've talked about that you've made personally, bad decision, reflected that. So uh, I think it, it really is comes back to. The, the, conf the drive, the push, the confidence you've got in yourself and your ability to work through others. And it's interesting too that uh, readings I've done about leadership and even from time to time I've addressed various groups on it and you go through the various you know, the people and communications and goal setting and, and you're always left with something at the end of it that you say, well, that doesn't quite add up somehow. There's something missing. And I was interested as a, 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 a fellow from Stanford. Uh, did some papers and work recently, uh, or a few years ago, on, uh, I think he called it emotional leading, emotional intelligence, emotional, like a, like you have an intelligence quotient, and it's an emotional quotient. And, and it said that it's, it's the feelings that you have about something and the feelings that you have about the people around you that are equally important to any other data you get. I.e., if, if something feels right, it probably is, as long as the other stuff stacks up. If it doesn't feel right, and we're making the point that to get those feelings in the right order, you really needed to know the people around you very well, to get to know how they feel about things, what their basic lifestyle beliefs are, and that when you really get to know the people around you, you will certainly know yourself very well by then, and the whole process becomes rather rather easier. What do you regard as your greatest success in business? Well, that's a bit like saying to an old soldier, uh, when uh, Grandchild says, uh, "You know, what was uh, what was your success in the war, Granddad?" And he said, "I survived." <laughs> I'm here, and uh, so in a sense, um, I can only speak for, for obviously for my career that I was in a number of uh, either in the company or on boards or something of public companies. Uh, in all of them, uh, the shareholders were. Um, pretty well rewarded, not times not as well as they would like to have been, at times better than that, but it's just the circle of, cycle of uh, the shares were safe, um, the staff were I think, well obviously at the time adequately rewarded, uh, the superannuation schemes in place for when they retired were solid, and uh, we produced, uh, I was fortunate in being in companies well, I thought it on my terms, I mean companies that were quite deeply involved with export. Uh, and, and that was part of my experience of going to business school in America. I think I, I came back 
with a more global view of life that I just wanted to be involved a bit with global trade. And uh, so I was in companies that earned good solid amounts of foreign currency. Um, so there's no one thing other than a, a general path that I think I can reflect on um, with some satisfaction. Moving then to something completely different, how important is it for a business leader to read widely? Well, it's hugely important. The difficulty is uh, that you have such an amount of stuff generated within the organisation that's, that's very personal to the group you're in with the reports and uh, uh, operating results and projects and uh, capital spending proposals and so and so and so. And then you'll have a lot of reading, or should be quite a bit on what's going on in the general world economy, whether it's The Economist you're going to look at, or Time, or Wall Street Journal, or so. Um, I quite like reading centennials that come out from time to time on, on a company. And I find usually the, the last 50 years to be moderately boring. But it's the early years that are so fascinating. Uh, Nestle was one that uh, I enjoyed reading. Uh, BP was another, because I was a bit involved with BP years ago as an advisory board. And you'll find that in most of these, many of these companies, great companies, they were as wobbly as hell at some stage of their formation, you know. And uh, when uh, Nestle uh, started making infant formula in Switzerland and so on, uh, uh, basically, you know, the Industrial Revolution and stuff came at the right time where People were met, moving into the cities, getting inadequate food, and babies were... And so, BP Oil, uh, what saved them, really, was when the, when the Admiralty, uh, British Admiralty, went from coal to oil in the ships, about, whatever it was, turn of the century, somewhere back in there. And so, even you look at uh, James Fletcher in New Zealand, the Fletcher Industries was helped enormously by the building program after the war for ha state houses. So, in all of this... At the time you get appointed to a senior job, sometimes luck has a hand in it. It's just what part of the cycle you come in, uh, whether it's diving downhill or growing, or whether new technology is just around the corner that's going to biff you sideways or make you into some sort of commercial giant. You're retired now. Do you ever feel you want to get back into public company directorships? No. Well, what you find is uh, you, you only... It was a bit like my rugby days. That you get to a stage... When I retired as an All Black, I was playing as good a rugby as I'd ever played. I just was not injured. Uh, but I did have a wife and three children, and we weren't paid in those days. You know, so you had to get on and earn a living. But really, I just had enough. I, I, you know, the travel and the being away and all that. I just, the magic had gone. And you get to a stage too, and in, in, after a while in business, that you feel now, oh, stuff it. You know, there's these younger fellows and girls coming on now, and they're full of energy and they're driving forward. And, you know, and for a few years, you can certainly help uh, with, the, with, with the wisdom of experience in years. And then you say, well, what? But so you find you're doing less of that, but I do much more now of what we could call socially good things, I suppose you could say. Uh, unfortunately, I don't need the money, so uh, Mercy Hospice, uh, the cochlear implant projects for children, you know, they, it's the most fantastic. I never knew they existed. You don't, a lot of things you don't know about until you actually get involved with where they can take profoundly deaf children, like totally deaf, and put a little thing in their ear when they're about three months old or six months, and they hear. It's the biggest, I don't know, from government's point of view, it's the best investment they can ever make. It costs 15000 or 20000 at the time, but from there on, they need no special, nothing. They just go to normal schools, do a normal job, and you know, 